What I'm asking you to do is think. Please, think. Why do you do what you do? Why do you dress the way you dress? Why do you use the jewelry you use? Why do you do what you do with your money? Why do you do what you do with your time? Why do you watch what you watch on television or at the movies or on the computer? Why do you do what you do on the computer? Do you have God-glorifying reasons for all of it? Do you live in that faith, believing what I am doing is glorifying God? Because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, you are to do it for the glory of God. We need to be people who think. Don't just do it because other people at school do it. Don't just do it because other people at work do it. The worldly system is everywhere around us. Do what you do because you can substantiate it from the Word of God. Period. Are your motives deceitful desire, worldly desire, desire that wages war against your flesh or against your soul, driven? Are they driven by those passions? Or is it driven by a desire to please God? That's what we have to ask ourselves. What is the motive? Well, I dress this way because I want to get this guy's attention. I hope you would see what the motive is. When the Bible says, if you want to get a guy's attention, the kind of guy that, guy's attention that you probably ought to be trying to get, you should be working on a meek and quiet spirit, ladies, knowing the Scriptures. That's what 1 Peter 3 says. I mean, young guys, if you're, if you're working out to get the lady's attention, you're working out because you want to be all hulked up and big and look like the world. Now look, physical exercise profits some. If it helps you discipline yourself and it helps you feel better and you're not near as tired during the day and you can get by with less sleep and it just overall makes you feel better, there may be a place for it. But is it Godliness driven. What we wear. I mean, do you wear what you wear because you're wanting to glorify God? Do you give? Do you use your money in ways that are God glorifying? What is your motive behind what you do with your money? If you're going to make the decision to have a television or not have one, I know Christians that have them. I know Christians that don't have them. What's your motive? What are you accomplishing? When you eat, why do you eat the way you do? When you drink. If you were going to say, well, the Bible allows me to drink alcoholic beverage, you need to ask yourself, why? Why are you doing it? Is there a motive there that is God glorifying? It's not God glorifying if you do things that will cause a brother to stumble and you do it right, before, right in front of them. If meat or drink cause your brother to stumble, you need to abstain. Why do we do what we do? Are we trying to win people to Christ? Hudson Taylor dressed like a Chinaman to win Chinamen, and he did. Paul became all things to all men that he might save some. By all means, he might save some. 
You see, when you're driven by love, when you're driven by a desire to save people, when you're driven by a desire to grow, when you're driven by a desire to become more godly, when you're driven by a desire to become more meek, more Bible knowledgeable, when you're driven by a desire not to make my brothers and sisters stumble, that there's see see the motivation? Versus when you just want pleasure. And so you're going to do what you want to do because you want fun. You're going to do what you want to do because you want to enjoy. You're going to do what you want to do because you want to satisfy these desires. That's dangerous ground. Listen. They wage war against the soul. And people lose their soul in this fight all the time. By God's grace, by God's strength, by God's power, abide in Christ and seek to live the right motives, bringing your thought life, bringing your motives in subjection to Christ all the time, in subjection to Christ, being led, guided, motivated by love. Let love rule your life. Let love for God and love for your fellow man rule your motives, not passions, but love. God help us.
Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. One thing about Scripture, it just drops it like a ton of lead right on you. So absolute. Why? I mean, come on, John. Give us a little slack here. Can I love some, some things in the world just a, a little? Why does, it, why does it seem like so often Scripture just... I mean, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Period. You know why? You know why I have to believe that? Because just like with the rest of John, if you come along and you say you know him and you don't keep his commandments, bang! Again. Just boom! Hit you with a ton of lead. You're a liar. Mm. Brethren, the reality is this. It's like Paul Washer said before. If you came in this door right now and you told us you just got hit by an 18-wheeler and you look just like you all look right now, we'd all say you're lying to us. I don't think that's, that's the basic weight of the matter. He's saying, look, when you're born again and when you're indwelt by the Spirit of God, it is so radical and it so produces a love for God and a hate for this world that it is so stark, it is so real, it is so obvious that is there a battle? Well, yes, there's a battle because obviously we've got to wage war against these anti-soul forces, one of which is the world that we're not to be conformed to, we're not to love it. And so there is this fight not to do it, but it is so real and it is so... It, brethren, it isn't the kind of thing where you live your life in love with the world all the time and you're trying to get out the magnifying glass and stare and look and strain and squint to figure out if you're a Christian or not. The truth is, this is so, this is so obvious when it happens to somebody's life. It takes them where they're in this course and it totally spins them around so obviously that, brethren, I've seen it. I've seen this happen to people. The worldliness just starts to fall off. One after another, it falls off. And I'll tell you this, people that have supposedly had this amazing, this amazing transformation happen in their life and conversion, and all of a sudden, two, three, four, five years down the road, the worldliness just hasn't fallen off, brethren. They're just, there's no truth to it. Mm -hmm. You say, well, you can't say that. You're judging I can say that because God's Word says that. If that person shows by a continuous ongoing lifestyle that they're in love with the world, they do not love God. They are those adulteresses and adulterers that James is dealing with, and they're at enmity with God. Lay it down. Hands down, folks. This is, this is absolute. I mean, this is... Brethren, yes, there's a battle. I don't, I don't doubt that. But this is a battle for life and death. And that's what we're told here.